Um, good afternoon, or is it morning to everyone? Um, today we are privileged to have our own uh, Verena Rush, who will be presenting to us on increasing bioinformatics uptake in Africa through unique learning models. Uh, just as a quick uh, reminder, please let's keep our mics mute uh, while the talk is ongoing. And at the end of the talk, if we have questions, uh, we can then ask. Or while the talk is going, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box. So just a quick uh, introduction of Verena. I know most of us here know her as she been working with HA Bionet. Uh, she is the coordinator of our training uh, uh, program. And she is the co-chair of HA Bionet Education and Training Working Group. She focuses on developing inclusive training models and increasing capacity for bioinformatics data analysis on the African continent. And she is also a PhD at the University of the Western Cape, where she is investigating species diversity, connectivity, and patterns of gene flow of gelatinous zooplankton along the west coast of Africa. And she is here today to present to us. So um, not to waste much time, please, Verena, you will now have the opportunity to present to us. Thank you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Wisdom, and hi to everyone on the call. There are only a few people on the call, so that actually makes it a little bit less intimidating, I think. Uh, but as Wisdom yeah. said, I am Verena Ras. I am a training and outreach coordinator for HA Bionet, um, and I've been working with HA Bionet for the last few years. And um, one of my key roles is designing learning models that are fairly accessible um, for those situated across the continent. We obviously focus primarily in on Africa. Um, and so we try to design models with that in mind, with you know the challenges that many African countries face in mind. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of the models we've designed and how we've gone about actually implementing some of them over the last few years. So just to give you a brief overview of what I'll be covering with this talk, I'm going to introduce HAA Bionet. I'm pretty sure most of us are familiar with HAA Bionet, but I thought um, to be you know, well-rounded, I uh, will just do a brief introduction of HAA Bionet. I'll cover HAA Bionet training and some of our training activities over the last decade or so. Um, and then I'll speak at length to our multiple delivery mode training model, um, which is a popular model that, that has allowed us to actually reach thousands of, of participants across Africa um, simultaneously for the last few years. And then I'll also talk about how we started to adapt our model um, for more advanced training and what we've managed to accomplish with that. And then also cover a little bit of our work around fair and bioschemas and making our materials accessible to everybody across the continent. So for those who may not be too familiar with us, HCA Bionet is a pan-African bioinformatics network, and we are part of the Human Heredity and Health in Africa Consortium, also known as HC Africa. We are comprised of roughly 28 partners in across about 17 countries, and we have well over 200 members, so a well-established network that has definitely grown um, over the years. But just, just very simply, um, HA Bionet was established to develop bioinformatics capacity in Africa, and specifically to enable genomics data analysis by HCA Africa researchers across the continent, of course. Now, HCA Bionet has been developing human um, capacity through training, support for data analysis, facilitating access to infrastructure, um, and by developing, you know, and providing access to things like pipelines and tools for primarily human microbiome and pathogen genomic data analysis. Um, and we've come a long way over, over the, the span of HA Bionet. But the main goal, of course, of HA Bionet is to increase the number of qualified bioinformatics graduates on the continent, while also creating research opportunities and providing financial support for promising graduates in bioinformatics on the continent. Now, one of the ways that we 
you know, enhance and improve capacity is through training. And so training is a very large component of what HA Pioneer does. does. Um, and I would say it underpins nearly every other activity within HA Pioneer. Training is really vital. And so um, we view it as being as vital as it is. And so we put a lot of effort and work into our training, into our models, into the way we deliver training. And so I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish um, over the last decade or so. So HA Pioneer delivers training in many different formats and modalities. Um, originally, of course, when we just started out, um, a large focus was on face-to-face -face workshops. And to date, we have run well over 30 face-to-face -face workshops or courses um, as part of HA Pioneer. We've done multiple train the trainer activities and courses um, and programs where we are actually aiming to develop trainers. So really good trainers who can train bioinformatics really, really well. Um, and one partnership that we've developed over time is also with the carpentries. And so we've tried to also um, train up a whole bunch of carpentries instructors. And I'm happy to chat a bit about where you can find out more information about the carpentries. Um, but that is for foundational coding, to teach foundational coding. Um, and so just this past year, we've actually just um, certified a whole new cohort of carpentry trainers, which I'm also very excited about. We have focused quite a lot on internships, so placing interns in labs with resources, getting them trained up so that they can go back to their countries and then implement, of course, what they've learned. So about 20 interns approximately have been placed um, as part of HA Binance internship program. We also run a number of hackathons and data jamborees um, where the focus is on actually developing something, developing a product, developing a workflow or analyzing some specific data. Um, so this is more for you know, some hands-on experience and also brings together some more advanced bioinformaticians to actually work on something. Um, also graduates or students who maybe haven't had the opportunity to collaborate on a real bioinformatics project or workflow or tool, we bring them together and we have these hackathons and data jamborees and they're quite exciting. But by far, um, the model that has reached the most people will obviously be our online training, but the way we do online training is slightly different. Um, we have our traditional online training models where you know you just log on for a workshop and we present a series of lectures, maybe have a few, a few activities. Um, but more often than not, we use what we call a multiple delivery mode training model to reach many more participants with adequate support. We have on-site classrooms um, to support those participants, but I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. Um, I will just firstly start by saying that we have published a paper about how we've sort of developed a sustainable bioinformatics training um, environment across Africa. And so if anybody's interested in reading about all the different things we do to make our training sustainable, make it impactful, make it accessible, you can find out a lot of information from this paper. I'm not gonna talk to it at any great length, but I've just pulled out a few of the stats and images from that particular paper. So you'll see these in that paper, just to give you an idea of our reach. Um, over time. And so on the top left of the slide, you can just see some of the, the sort of backgrounds that many of our trainees come to us from. Um, so you can see a large proportion of our trainees come from a wet lab background. And that's actually very exciting because we do want to preach the wet lab with the computation. Um, and so that's always great to see that so many people from that background is actually taking up our training. We of course have people who are bioinformatics scientists. They would generally take some more advanced courses, of course, um, but we also have everywhere from bioinformatics engineers. So those are analysts and developers um, to even people who are not involved in bioinformatics. And that is always quite exciting. So we have psychologists, genetic counselors, doctors, sometimes architects I've, I've noticed. Um, so we have quite a large spread of people who are interested in our training. And that's actually very exciting. Then you'll also see the number of trainees that we've managed to train over the years. You can see an explosion from about 2016. So 2016 is when we started delivering these mixed sort of models. And you can see the direct impact of those mixed models just by looking at the number of trainees um, that we've managed to reach over the years. And you can see that explosion um, for 2021 and 22, it's even higher. And that's really, really exciting. 
you can also see that many trainees attended multiple training events. And so to me, that tells me that they were quite happy with the training, with the product um, and what they managed to gain from the training. So you can see that obviously um, most people would have attended one or two courses, but there are quite a number of people who have gone on to attend three, four, five, even 11 courses with HA Bionet. So that, that's quite, quite nice to see. Um, and then at the top here, we've just got a heat map with some of the actual numbers that we've managed to reach um, with our courses. And this is just people who have taken a combination of courses that we've got presented here. You can see for, for the most part, most people have taken our introduction to bioinformatics course. Um, that is the large number that's represented here. I'll talk to that again in just a second. But then many people have taken metagenomics courses, also professional development, um, and so on and so on. But quite a wide range of topics that we teach on and quite a, a, a large amount of people who have taken quite a number of these courses. And so that's again, very exciting because you can see how they've developed from taking the introductory course to taking more advanced courses. And some even go on to do like our sysadmin courses from taking the, the introductory courses. So they've gone all the way through our training pipeline, which is very, very exciting. So I want to just switch now to talk about this multiple delivery mode training model. I've mentioned it quite a couple of times with this talk now, but I'd like to just sort of um, outline what this model is and how we've used it. So the regional model was developed by my predecessor, Kim Kowitz, um, along with the rest of our training team, some of whom are still with us now, many of whom are still with us now. Um, and what they did was decide to combine on-site learning with online learning and distance learning all in one program um, to really get maximum impact, maximum reach, and just really help as many people as possible. You can imagine that when HA Bionic started, the focus was, uh, quite quite largely on face-to-face -face courses. Um, but with a face-to-face course, you can reach anywhere from 20 to 30 people at best. Um, traveling people around is very expensive. You know, visas are very complicated in Africa a lot of the time. Accommodation is very expensive. Everything's really, really expensive. And so what the team tried to do was combat some of that by using a mixed sort of model approach. And so what they decided to do was to actually have on-site classrooms across various countries in Africa registered to host the course. They went through obviously a selection process, a quite strict selection process. And once they were um, sort of determined to be adequate to host the course, they were then allowed to be formally appointed as a host. We then went through a formal um, application process for participants. Participants would apply to these classrooms, also go through a selection process. But for our introduction to bioinformatics course, we wanted the, the criteria, the prerequisites to be very, very minimal. And so we just said, you know, if you have an internet connection um, or if you come from just a basic wet lab background, if you're just interested in bioinformatics, you can join the course. And so um, the classrooms were then um, required to have certain infrastructure. Of course, for the introductory course, we didn't need much. We used predominantly online tools so that the classrooms could also overcome that infrastructure, you know, sort of burden and hurdle. And so all they needed were, was a lab with computers that had access to the internet. Participants came there twice a week for about three and a half months. So quite, quite, the, quite a long course. They covered six modules. Um, but within that classroom, they were also supported by staff. So they're teaching assistants, systems administrators there um, for on-site support. And then they had all of us as the core team in the background, um, just supporting the classrooms and supporting them and managing them. They were all managed via a learning management system, which is sort of the distance or online learning component of the course. Um, with that online learning system, which we used, which is called Vula, you see that here on the slide. Um, we actively managed participants. We also administered tests. We administered assignments, feedback surveys. We put all the lecture recordings there. We put all of the lecture slides. There any other resources that would help them um, complete the course or, the, or that particular module. And we actually actively managed and tracked all of them. And we started with a cohort of about five or 600. We now have a yearly cohort of well over a thousand. So the course has also grown organically because anybody who's able to host the course can host it. And so we started with maybe 20 something classrooms and now we're up to above 50 classrooms per year that run in parallel. So you can immediately see the impact of the model. Now the model was of course, 
first used for predominantly our introduction to bioinformatics course, which used online tools. But then over time, with us training more and more people and actually training thousands of people a year now, um, there was this natural sort of need or demand for more advanced training using the model. And so we started to adapt this model um, and it was quite, quite an interesting experience. Um, I helped a lot with adapting the model for more advanced training. And I learned a lot along the way as well. But essentially, the major change from the first um, sort of way we ran things to now was that we wanted classrooms to actually, you know, have the infrastructure to actually do something once the course ended. And so we also wanted, you know, staff to get trained on the infrastructure, to get trained on the tools and pipelines that we were teaching and become familiar with them so that they could support the participants even after the course ended but also have it available there for real analyses and to also train additional researchers um, well, well beyond the course ending. And so the way that we did it with the adapted advanced model is that we had a team of developers support our training. And what the developers did was package all of our tools, our data sets, our software, all the dependencies for all of that into containers. For this particular course, we use singularity containers all classrooms who were eligible to host, of course, here the infrastructural requirements were much higher than the online course, um, but all classrooms who were um, approved to host the course then had to actually pull the containers, install them, manage them locally, and actually give their participants access to their clusters or servers. So it was a very realistic environment. And then we had them run across, obviously, a test data set, but it was a real data set that was just subsetted. And we had them run real analysis with that data sets throughout the course. Um, for many classrooms, once the course ended, it then meant that while the container was there, it was usable. All you had to do was scale it. If you, you know, wanted more tools, better tools, larger data sets or more capacity. Um, but essentially, lots of participants could actually analyze their actual data by the end of the course. This particular course was a 16S course. And so participants came with a 16S raw data plugged it into the workflows and the pipelines, used the facilities and actually ran a lot of the analysis, even as part of the course um, in some cases. And so that was very exciting because it was very realistic. It was what they would actually do when the course ended and seeing as the classrooms have now pulled and managed that infrastructure, they got training and support um, throughout that process and then were ready to then support the participants once the course ended as well, or any other researchers within their labs or institutes who were interested in using their, their resources and the software. Everything else about the course remained pretty much similar. Um, we had our teaching assistants and our systems administrators on site. Of course, with this course, the sysadmin became a very vital sort of a role within the classroom. They obviously had to manage a lot of issues. Um, but what we were really happy about was that the infrastructural requirements for the participants still remained really low because we were using, you know, cloud um, facilities. We were using servers or clusters or whatever it might be that they were using locally. It did change from classroom to classroom. But essentially, the participants didn't have to come with a high spec laptop. All they needed was access to the command line um, and to be able to get online. And so that we also thought was a really big success because realistically, when you're running this type of, of, of analyses, you're not really going to be doing it on a local desktop for the most part. You're going to be doing it in the cloud. And so they got that experience and also saw the benefits of doing things in the cloud and how quickly it runs, you know, the compute power. And that was, of course, very exciting for us. Now, that is a little bit about the multiple delivery mode training model. I haven't covered it in, in great depth or detail, um, but those are the vital components. So it's the online learning, distance learning, and then also, of course, the face-to-face -face learning. With COVID, I must say, um, that threw a span into the works. Our face-to-face -face classrooms couldn't go ahead face-to-face -face anymore. And so the model actually evolved again to become just truly a blended learning experience classrooms actually went virtual. So we are currently running an NGS course using the model, which we run in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust. And what we actually do with that particular course is we get everybody to sign on <laughs> online to a Zoom room um, four hours twice a week. We push them to breakout rooms. And so each breakout room represents a classroom that you know staff and participants have been registered to. And then we pull them back um, for Q&A with the module trainers. 
One thing I didn't mention before um, when I was speaking about the model is that we have expert trainers situated mostly in Africa who pre-record all the lecture content, um, but also make themselves available during the live sessions for Q&A. And that happened both when we were face-to-face -face as well as when we were online. Classrooms would connect and then actually also get the benefit of chatting to the trainer, um, benefiting from the trainer being there and being able to help and assist with queries or issues. And so that is always fantastic. And we see the benefits of that even more so when we have shifted now to our advanced models, because now we've got all these amazing trainers with all this knowledge who can really help with, you know, some of the more technical issues um, or content related issues that, that perhaps the core team might not have been well placed to help with. And that's always very fantastic. And um, I think what's great about the model as well is that the trainer pre-records the lecture content, comes online for an online Q&A. And so the trainer can be situated anywhere. I mean, in the past, I think many of us who have done training either as a student or as the trainer um, who've managed to be traveled to a different country or to a different organization, they will know how difficult all those logistics are. Getting trainers, especially expert trainers, to come to certain countries also very difficult so this removed all of those barriers, basically. Um, and trainers could record the content from anywhere and also sign on from anywhere. And it really still felt present. And so that was really, really fantastic. But one thing we also realized was there's no point in creating all these wonderful materials if nobody can continue to access it, continue to utilize it. And so we've started to, we not started to, but we have for the last few years really um, sort of adopted the principles of FAIR. So making things findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is very important to us. Um, also very important for our training materials. And so one thing that we've tried to do with a lot of our courses is to add Creative Commons licenses to our slide decks, to our videos, to the course in general, so that anybody who could benefit from it in the future can take, take those slides, take the model, you know, and implement it themselves if they'd like to. Um, and so many of our materials are now being marked up with things like bioschemas, um, to make it more sort of machine readable and scrapable so that things like, so that other sort of repositories or catalogs can scrape in our materials and say, hey, here's where the materials are. This is what the materials are about. And these are the licenses. And for the most part, the licenses are all Creative Commons. And so you can actually take the materials and adapt it as long as you, of course, cite the relevant person or people. And so, so this has been something we've really been pushing. Um, if you go to the HA Bionet website now, you'll actually see that across many of our training pages, we are currently busy implementing a lot of this. And um, I'm, I'm quite excited and happy about that. Fair is the future, in my opinion. Um, you want to make your, your content as findable, as reusable as possible. That is very vital in training. Um, oftentimes people create wonderful training materials, wonderful courses, but it's not accessible. You can't find the materials once the course ends. And that's a very big problem um, because that's kind of dead knowledge in a way. And so that's something we've really tried to, to combat. Um, if you'd like to read more about what bioschemas are, if you might be interested in it yourself, um, you can go to the bioschemas.org website and read a little bit more about that. They've got the course and training profiles up there as draft profiles at the moment. So you're welcome to explore that as well. One thing that I'd just very quickly like to touch on as well is our work with competencies. Um, so one thing we've also tried to drive with the development of, of HA Bionic courses is the development of competencies within those courses. So for those of you who might not be too aware, I'm not gonna speak to competencies at, at great length, um, but the International Society for Computational Biology have in the past suggested core bioinformatics competencies for bioinformaticians. And what they've done is actually map competencies to different personas. So you would imagine that um, people in different roles wouldn't necessarily need the same competencies or might need the same competencies, but not at the same depth. And so they did a lot of work around that, a lot of work to define, you know, when you are a physician, when you are an ethicist, a curator, what kind of bioinformatics competencies do you need and at what granularity? So this was published um, a little while ago and there's actually an updated version due to come out soon, which then takes it a step further. But I, again, I'm not going to talk too much about that. What I'd like to say here is that 
Many of the HA Bionic courses and trainings now are developed with these competencies in mind with developing specific competencies. They are a little bit different to learning objectives in that one competency can encompass multiple learning objectives. Um, and so we've really tried to drive the development of a lot of our courses with um, these competencies in mind. The 16S course, which I spoke about a little bit earlier, um, we've done full competency mapping on, and we've actually hit quite a number of the competencies that we were hoping to hit for the particular persona that we were designing the course for. But the great thing about competencies is it just really helps you, um, it just helps drive the development of your training. It helps, you know, helps you structure it because you know the persona you're designing the training for, uh, based on some of the this work, you can then see based on that persona, what competency should I be focusing on at what granularity? And it just helps you tailor the course for the audience appropriately. And so that's been a great addition, I think, to HA Bionic training is this, you know, addition of, of, of developing competencies as part of our training processes. One other thing that we focused on quite a lot is the development of guides and SOPs. Um, and so HA Bionet, not just for training, but in general, have developed a range of guides and standard operational procedures. You'll find them scattered across our website. Um, many are currently being uploaded, but we also do have a sort of guide for training. And you can see just from this image that our training process is quite complex. It's not as simple as we're going to do a training now, let's invite some trainers and this is what we'd like to teach. We go through basically all of these steps whenever we design a training. Of course, these steps differ a little bit um, with our face-to-face -face courses versus our online versus our mixed um, model courses, but we go through all of these steps and you can see that one of the steps here is also to perform competency mapping, to define objectives, learning outcomes. Um, so we've got a very well sort of um, developed process and training environment actually that that have that has organically developed, I think, um, through the progression of HA Bionet. And I'm happy to provide you a link to one of our training guides if you're interested in that. Um, the guide has both step-by-step -step instructions around how we develop our training, our timings. Um, we also provide templates. And again, everything is free to reuse. That's very important to us. So I am running towards the end of my talk now. I've got a few minutes left. Um, so with the end of this talk, what I'd like to just express is a bit of sadness uh, because HA Bionet is actually coming to an end. We are working on you know, sustainability of certain products, um, training being one of them, but HA Bionet is officially coming to an end and you might not hear about HA Bionet in the future, but hopefully you do. But one thing that I'd like to say is that we're not gonna disappear completely. Uh, most of, well, not most, but many of the HA Bionet products, projects have now been kind of incorporated into the new NIHDSI Africa sort of um, grant, uh, program initiative and uh, many of us are forming part of the open data science platform as well as part of that initiative and so we hope that some training can continue as part of that it might not be the same um, but we are also really hoping that a lot of training um, can still sort of sustain from you know HA Bionet into the future and so we are working on that but again that is why fear is so important to us getting our materials up into repositories, for example, making it accessible and findable is very vital to us. And so we focused a lot on that um, so that if for some reason we do completely disappear, our materials, our courses, everything is still accessible, it's still available. You know, it hasn't all been for nothing in a sense. And so um, this is just some information about the Open Data Science Platform for those who might be interested in it. It's called Elwazi. I'm not going to talk about this too much um, because the focus of the talk is obviously not, not on this. And I want to just keep things quite focused for this particular talk. Um, and that actually brings me to the end of, of my talk and my presentation. I'd obviously just like to thank the amazing training team at HA Bionet that has supported us over the years, um, past and present. Um, they've been such a, a humongous help over the years and I've learned a lot from them. I hope they've learned something from me over time. But then also, of course, to all of our staff across Africa who have taken on the mixed model um, courses, they volunteer their time, nothing is paid 
uh, well, they don't get paid for, for you know, taking up these courses. And so I just want to say a big thank you to all of them as well for just supporting us and helping us reach many, many more people across Africa. So thank you to everybody in our training teams um, for being involved in all of these endeavors. And I hope that this talk has shed some light on some of our activities um, over the last decade or so. So thanks, everyone. Well, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh... Verena for this uh, in-depth presentation. I think over the years, there has been a lot of trainings and a lot of work going on from your side and from the other members. Um, this has been very, very impactful. Um, just a, a quick uh, question from me, maybe before anybody else who has a question. Um, you showed us the number of trainees per year and your slide ended somewhere in 2020. I'm looking yeah. at the great interests uh, over the years. What, what, how is the figure looking like for 2021 and then 2022? I'm sure we made I would a, like to say, a large number. I would like to say better. <laughs> Um, so our numbers have grown actually from 2020, um, but what we're trying to focus on a lot more now, um, I think a lot of people know about HA Pioneer, a lot of people want to join our courses, um, but because of COVID especially and the model shifting online and changing slightly, we did start to experience a slightly higher dropout rate, for example. So what we've been focusing on more now, especially this year, is retention. So it's retention, 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 you know, getting them through the whole course through to the end. Um, and so our number, our focus have, has kind of been less on numbers and more on just getting the trainees through the program so that we don't experience higher dropout rates, um, especially with the model changing. And so I'm going to say that overall, we are reaching more people. That number has grown quite substantially. We've done, done a lot of online training and we've also ran IBT and also our 16S course and also our next generation sequencing course um, over 2021. And also now we'll run it this year. The NGS course is currently running and we've got about 600 people on that course. So the numbers are just booming and exploding in my opinion. But I, I just wanna say we are trying to focus a little bit more now on retention strategies. Um, because completion rates are, are actually very important to us. Great. Um, thanks, thanks very much for that. I can see, um, okay, Godwin says, thanks for the insightful presentation and for the work you guys are doing at H3 Bionet. Grateful. Um, if there's anybody who has some clarifications, some comments, actually saw Pabalo and but the PS is gone out or he's, he's left the room. Uh, thanks to Pabalo. Yes, Pabalo was here for a little bit. So Pabalo <laughs> was my co-coordinator uh, for the last few years. It was yeah. very sad to see him go. Um, he did say he would join very briefly because he's got another meeting. But it was nice to see him on the call. Yeah, he came around and just dropped out. Any other questions? Yes, there's a hand from Fatima. Can you speak? Yes, um, so hi, thanks a lot, Verena. Thanks a lot to um, you for organizing this, um, this meeting. I'm so sorry I joined a bit late because I had another meeting that was um, initially planned to end up at, uh, at the top of the hour, but, um, but unfortunately I'm so late. So I'm so sorry, Verena. However, I know uh, the, uh, the, the tremendous work you've been doing throughout these uh, you know, years of efforts that you've been putting into the H3 Bionet. Um, uh, courses uh, and organization of these courses. And I do know, as you just mentioned it, uh, Verena, that the numbers are really tremendously growing. And it seems that there is a lot more interest in these bioinformatic courses than ever before. <laughs> and I do kind of, you know, um, fear that, they, I know there are plenty of other initiatives throughout Africa, like the NGS Academy and things like that. But the format that Atria Burnett was offering was kind of you know unique in the sense that the, the, the participants are, are, are having teaching assistance, they are having support, they are connecting uh, with each other throughout the Vula system. And I was kind of wondering how this would come to an end uh, or how this can be taken up afterwards by Eliwazi. Would there be any continuous program uh, for the students? Because we have a growing number 
even in our individual nodes of people willing to take these classes. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Thanks for the question, Fatma. Um, so it is very difficult for me to say where the future is going to go, um, but I do know that we are trying to work on quite a number of sustainability strategies um, to keep at least some of these flagship courses and trainings definitely going. Um, the nice thing about H, um, this, this mixed model is that it has been developed, the materials have been developed, um, we know how the model works and a lot more classrooms across Africa now have experience with the model. So one thing that I hope is that Perhaps it will be a voluntary effort. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to put in the time as well, because I think it is such a such a useful and impactful way of teaching. Um, but I think what's great is you don't have to have a lot of resources to do it. Um, and so in that way, it is naturally sustainable. All it needs is somebody like me who coordinates it um, and trainers who might still be willing to be involved. Um, but luckily for us, even if the trainers don't want to be involved, the materials at the very least are developed. And then perhaps a, a lot more sort of responsibility might be placed on the staff that we've developed over the years across these various classrooms. But I definitely think there is an opportunity to keep a lot of it going. But I think a lot of thinking needs to go around that. Um, I do know that, that there were plans to absorb some of this into al -Wazi, but I'm not sure exactly how much and to what to what degree. Um, I'm not sure whether the trainings within Owazi will be as open as HA Bionets were before. Um, so for those who don't know, like all of our trainings were free and if you could come, you could come and you can take it. Um, I'm not too sure whether that will be a similar model with Owazi, but I definitely think that it's very easy to have these courses running within Owazi if there's, if there's, you know, willingness from us to put in the effort. And I mean, I'm definitely willing I think I've I've also grown to really love a lot of the people that I've that I've met over the years, the classrooms, the staff, the participants, and so I wouldn't want to just disappear and leave them alone. Um, so I'm definitely willing if the classrooms would still be willing to continue with the programs. Great. Uh, I can see from Adijat that great talk. Okay. Yeah, this has really been a great talk and. Uh, very, very, very impactful, especially the work that has uh, been going on for the past 10 years. I still, <laughs> so been very, very, I, I have been a beneficiary from the very beginning, attending workshops and, and trainings and all of that. So yeah, this has been a very great, 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 great part of H3A Bionet. Are there still other clarifications, other comments? And see, okay, so the training has really made an impact, myself included. Okay, from Adijat also says he benefited from the training that Verena and others have been organizing. Very great. Yeah, and Adijat has been involved in our training actually also for quite some time. So <laughs> it's yeah. nice to see her here. Um, and she's okay. also joined us at the University of Cape Town recently as a PhD student. So very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. So thanks very much, Verena, for taking the time. Actually, Verena is on leave and she's <laughs> offered to be talking to us today. So we are most, most grateful that you're spending some time with us. Um, in, the, in the coming uh, month, we will also announce our next uh, talk and then the, the details will be communicated to all of you. And a big thank you to all of you who have made the time to be with us today and hope that next time we will all be available. And Verena, thanks very much once again. And I wish all of you a very fruitful day. Thank you so much. Um, and good luck with everybody's bioinformatics activities. All right. Thank you so much, Verena. Thanks a lot, Wisdom. Yeah, thanks. Bye.